Thank you. Uh, in any case, my name is Marian. Uh, I'm the chief system architect of SiteGround. Uh, I help organize OpenFest and a few other conferences. And I also uh, teach in Sofia University Linux system administration courses and network security courses. So uh, today I decided that I will speak for four different things. And since uh, it would be very annoying to, for you to listen to me for four hours, so I decided to have uh, all of these four talks squeezed into one uh, session. This is why this is called four sessions. First uh, is the performance. So. Mm, I was uh, at Open Source Summit uh, North America and met a few Intel guys there and actually listened to a talk about this there. The idea is that uh, you can actually increase uh, the performance of your software without recompiling your software, but replacing certain parts of your system and abusing uh, what you already have in uh, your processors. Uh, stuff that were made for video, for gaming, uh, are now uh, abused for uh, artificial intelligence and for simply getting more out of uh, your software. This is what I'm going to talk to you about. So advanced vector extensions are part of Intel. So well, I'm talking about only Intel specific uh, things here. I'm sorry about this. Uh, I haven't read about uh, the stuff that uh, AMD support. Some of these things are supported in their CPUs also. But uh, mainly the stuff I will be talking about is uh, Intel supported. So advanced vector extensions are uh, extensions that allow you to uh, bundle uh, a few of the, uh, your data into a larger registers. And we have different uh, AVX extensions, like the first one was uh, uh, 128 bits, uh, then the second one was uh, 256, and then we now have uh, 512 uh, AVX. You understand this in a bit. This all started with uh, something very uh, simple, streaming uh, SIMD extensions, which is single instruction, multiple data. Uh, very a lot of acronyms here, I know, but uh, bear with me. So what you want to do is, uh, usually when you have a 32-bit uh, CPU, you have 32-bit registers there. But when we have 64-bit uh, CPUs, uh, we have 64-bit uh, registers. This means that we have doubled the, uh, doubled the memory that we can use uh, to send information to the CPU. Uh, the problem is that not all software uh, uses this uh, at the moment. So you can uh, replace your 32-bit software with 64-bit software, but uh, it does the same thing. What you can do is actually vectorize everything and uh, use bigger uh, registers, what are uh, proposed from SE and uh, AVX. For giving more data to the CPU to uh, Parallel, uh, parallelize your, uh, your data processing. So uh, what you can do is uh, abuse the AVX and SSE uh, extensions for matrix uh, multiplication, for binary. You can speed up the binary operations like 12 times. Uh, you can speed up uh, uh, populating the information to the CPU uh, four times. And uh, I'll show you a little bit here, vectorization. The, the idea is that uh, we need bigger ve vectors for uh, usually video rendering. And uh, what you can do usually is uh, uh, this simple uh, uh, matrix uh, addition here. Uh, you can do it without vectorization. And uh, what, you, uh, what you get is you get the first uh, register here and the other four not used. So you, you can have two 64-bit uh, registers here and uh, you're using a 32-bit integer here, right? So what's happening is you can actually use uh, 
all four of these registers, but your software uses only the first one and nothing else. So you're losing three of your uh, three of your 32-bit uh, registers that you can use at the moment. Unfortunately, since you're on a 64-bit uh, architecture, you're actually using half of your first uh, register, not the full register even. So what you can do here is uh, replace this uh, with uh, function instruction in Intel where you can replace it, uh, make it so that uh, you would send four 32-bit integers and uh, it will act on all four of them as if you have uh, given four different uh, integers but it would be in a single instruction. So what you would get here is around uh, 2.5 to 3 times uh, the increase of performance simply of putting this data into the CPU and then uh, actually uh, doing the work on it. So uh, addition of uh, those four and four uh, registers. Uh, some very simple benchmarking here. Uh, first one uh, is uh, with vectorization and the other is without vectorization. The code on the bottom is uh, actually the code from GitHub that was used for this uh, specific benchmark. So without vectorization, even with O3, we get uh, the one time, uh, the one single performance execution. With vectorization, we get around 16 times the uh, performance here. And we are talking about integer uh, addition here. You can use this uh, for multiplication, for uh, there are different uh, instructions here that you can use for floating point uh, uh, multiplication and a lot of other stuff. So let's look about. Uh, Look at this here. You have the normal registers. Uh, Bobby started uh, earlier with uh, uh, talking about uh, disassembly and assembly. Uh, the things there are uh, normal registers, which are the, your 32 uh, 64 bit registers. Here you can see that uh, the SSE uh, registers start with Z. You have six uh, registers that you can use. And you, can, you actually have uh, instructions that can use all six of them uh, with a single instruction, while normal uh, instructions in your CPU take about two to four uh, instructions in a single uh, of instructions, registers for a single instruction. So now you can have six, two more here. And there are 128 uh, bit uh, in our registers. And when we skip to uh, AVX uh, 512, what's happening is that we <laughs> have uh, quadrupled uh, the data that we can send to the CPU, and it will continue uh, do the same task for the same time, but with uh, four times uh, the amount of data here. And if we compare this with the 64-bit uh, registers, you already get me here, right? So uh, what else? Uh, you can have, oh, I forgot to say this, uh, this here is uh, the actual floating point uh, uh, multiplication here. So we can get uh, even 20, 23 uh, uh, times the performance with AVX2. So uh, it's very complicated to implement it yourself simply because you have to write assembly code to again use uh, the functionality that you have in your uh, uh, CPUs. But uh, Intel started a strange, for me strange project, uh, Clear Linux, which has packages for you. So if you go to uh, their GitHub, you can actually download the packages for glibc. Uh, R, Python, or uh, a lot of other, I think they have like uh, um, 400 or more packages there. So they, what's the idea? You have your, for example, MySQL running uh, on your normal uh, Debian or uh, CentOS distribution. If you replace your glibc with Intel's glibc that was optimized specifically for this CPU, uh, what you would get is uh, all these operations that are uh, additions, multiplications, so searches, joins in uh, MySQL, 
they start to be faster and faster depending on uh, the actual world, the, the actual instructions that are set. And this is transparent for you simply because uh, you have replaced the glibc which is responsible for handing, uh, handling these uh, high level functions and sending the data to the CPU. So very easily you can uh, use this. I have a time for questions now for this because this is the finish for this talk. Since which generation of uh, Intel processors these instructions are supported? Okay, so uh, AVX uh, is like mm, seven, eight years old, uh, 2010, uh, 2009, uh, and uh, SE, SSE started even before that, maybe 2004? Yeah, Haswell. Haswell, yeah. So uh, there, even older CPUs support this. Uh, AMD supports SEE, AVX. I'm not sure for AVX2 and AVX512. Uh, yeah. Uh, do Intel provide uh, repositories with packages for uh, CentOS and Debian? Uh, I, don't I don't think they provide repositories, but uh, they provide you with uh, the spec files uh, so you can build your packages. It's not so hard. <laughs> uh, the biggest issue there is that uh, once you replace like, your uh, glibc, you actually cannot upgrade uh, your distribution anymore because the next time you upgrade, it will replace the glibc, and you would again need to replace it. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm continuing with, uh, continuing with the next talk. So, uh, BPF. Uh, BPF is uh, something very old uh, in uh, our kernels in uh, Linux and in uh, BSD. Uh, it was mainly uh, used for networking, but uh, since 2014, uh, it's uh, started to change in the Linux kernel. Uh, so. The idea is to show you why and how they did it. So BPF is uh, a simple uh, instruction set, a very small instruction set that was uh, used primarily for uh, things like TCP dump for the sysadmins that are here. For the others, uh, it's a simple uh, set of instructions that you can use to uh, send from user space to the kernel. The kernel can verify these instructions, uh, can make sure that they're not harmful for the kernel, can make sure the time that it will take to uh, actually uh, finish all of them. So uh, it can verify and execute that. So this is why writing a kernel module, but instead of uh, adding the kernel module to your kernel, you're sending, it, uh, sending the data, the binary, to uh, the kernel, and it evaluates it with uh, just-in-time compiler. So it's simpler, or at least it was simple, uh, before 2014, primarily used for networking. What changed was uh, people found that it was easier to uh, extend this instead of writing modules for uh, the kernel to change all the infrastructure of the kernel. Now uh, eBPF, extended BPF, is used for uh, things like enabling uh, security modules, uh, uh, sniffing kernel drivers, uh, sniffing file systems, and by sniffing I mean uh, you can inject your BPF code in between calls to the file system, in between your driver and uh, your net filter interface and stuff like this. So what changed was uh, instead of, I, I don't remember how many registers we had in uh, uh, BPF, I think four or six, now we have uh, 10 registers. Uh, these are 64-bit registers. Uh, so you can have functions because it's functions, it's not exactly instructions in BPF, uh, that uh, use uh, 10 different uh, inputs. You have one magical uh, register, so there are 10, not 11, as uh, it's shown here. Uh, you have maps and hashes, uh, so 
Okay, this is like you would have a, a map a dictionary hash in any normal programming language. Now you have this in assembly-like <laughs> structure. Also, something that I missed here, you can reference a file descriptor that you have opened from user space. You can reference that from the kernel now. So you can load your data in the kernel and uh, it can send information to user space uh, via this uh, file descriptor or you can continuously send more data to the kernel uh, from this file descriptor. And there are the actions. You can actually do uh, different things like deny file system access, deny network connectivity, deny uh, certain capabilities that this process usually had. So this is a simple uh, BPF program, and it's not very simple, I know. <laughs> so uh, to be honest, uh, I don't write BPF like this, uh, and uh, most of the people I spoke to at conferences, they told me that they don't either. Uh, most of us are using the C interface uh, to BPF, so we have a library with a little bit high level uh, functions that allow us uh, to write something, and then uh, we have a BPF uh, compiler, or you may also call it converter of uh, the C code to uh, BPF. So uh, how does it work? Uh, you generate uh, your uh, BPF, uh, then uh, from that, okay, you write your uh, BPF, then you have this byte called uh, compiler, then uh, you load that uh, with the system call to the kernel, and the kernel verifies this. What uh, I haven't said is that uh, BPF is uh, final. This means that uh, at certain, uh, you have a limit of number of uh, uh, calls that you can make within a BPF uh, program. Uh, you don't have loops. Uh, it's not possible to make loops there. Uh, you have to reference different BPF code if you want to uh, jump somewhere, uh, if you want to continue your program. So. Uh, you have this verifier that verifies that your program will finish first, then uh, your program uh, is complete. I mean that uh, it will not uh, uh, stop at certain point and not get uh, more data or, or finish uh, working with your data. Then after the code is verified, it goes to the BPF engine, and the BPF engine uh, has hooks in different parts of the kernel. So you have uh, parts of the key, uh, the key probes, you have uh, uh, parts of uh, U-probes, uh, trace points, perf events, uh, you have parts uh, of the network stack that uh, yield different things for BPF. So all of these parts actually export functions for you, functions that you can use. And the BPF engine can stop anything that can be stopped with k-probes, u-probes, uh, uh, anything from the network. Uh, it can stop it in the middle, inspect the mm, data frame, currently the stack frame, and get the, this data and send it uh, to a map or to a file descriptor. And then uh, on the user space uh, part, which is uh, the yellow thing here, uh, you can collect this information from the kernel. So you can uh, write statistics for uh, your uh, software uh, or find why your machine is uh, slow, but you can do this only when uh, you want it. This is the big uh, plus of BPF because when you're uh, writing kernel modules, sometimes it's very hard to unload them, uh, at least when they're statistical kernel modules, because uh, someone is uh, keeping reference to them. So it takes a lot of time to make sure that you can unload this module. With BPF, that's not the problem. You simply load the program, it will execute, and uh, uh, it will finish. You, you can unload that, uh, that piece of code. So. This simplifies things, and you don't need to keep your kernel with all the debug information that uh, uh, you would want. Like, you, you can debug even uh, uh, CPU problems, uh, memory problems, that uh, usually, in order to debug, you have to add the debug code that will run all the time on this kernel. So this is a big problem there. And what we can do, uh, we have a lot of tools uh, already built for us. And uh, you can go with 
any of these parts in the kernel and in user space that can be uh, triggered or referenced by uh, BPF. And we have ready tools for this. So who wrote most of the stuff? Uh, Brendan Gregg, uh, he's from Netflix. Uh, I'm very happy I met him uh, a month ago uh, in LA. He thinks about uh, the performance of the machines. He, he calls himself senior performance architect, but I think he's a sysadmin that uh, really wanted to help these guys to uh, push it further. So all the things that uh, he wrote were uh, to make sure that he can diagnose different problems uh, in their infrastructure. So uh, I'll give you some examples directly from the docs. Uh, you can snoop the execution of uh, a process. Uh, you can also do this with test trace, I know. But uh, this shows that you can uh, do this also in the kernel and reference that. Uh, you can also do uh, files, uh, check the files that uh, something is opening. Something interesting here is that uh, since this is in the kernel, uh, it's actually a lot faster than S-Trace. So if you have a process that uh, is opening like 10,000 files a second, uh, when you're S-Tracing this, you're actually saying to the kernel, P-Trace this process, copy this information for me here, 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 here. And this copy is actually then uh, traversing from kernel space to user space again to the process to, that is S-Trace and showing this information. While what uh, BPF does is, uh, copying this to the kernel memory and reporting only via its maps. So it's very, very efficient. The things that I really like were uh, cache stat because sometimes you really want to know this process, how much of its memory is in uh, cache and uh, how much isn't. So cache stat, uh, bio white, uh, latency, uh, bio snoop, uh, run queue, uh, analyzing, analyzing the run queues of your CPUs, uh, it's very, uh, very hard, and you need a lot of the book code there for this. So I'll take one or two questions for this. There are no questions. You don't want to analyze stuff in your systems. OK, tomorrow I will have a workshop for BPF, uh, primarily for networking, but we can also use uh, uh, the analytics tools. The one thing that I haven't shown here is uh, like, if you haven't enabled, for example, in your MySQL uh, the query log, you can actually uh, have a Python script that uh, runs BPF, and uh, it can log all the queries that are going to MySQL on the fly, and uh, then you can disable this. So you don't need to restart your MySQL to enable this option. Uh, maybe they fixed it in your versions, but I don't remember seeing that. So uh, the third talk is uh, security. Mm, so I spoke with Ron about this. Again, I saw this uh, at uh, LinuxCon. Uh, this is something that I knew for a while. Uh, that uh, you don't own your CPUs and they actually uh, snoop on you and do stuff that you don't want them to do. Uh, but uh, this was the first time that it was explained to me in such a way. So I will use directly his presentation. I actually asked him. Uh, Ron Minich uh, presented this uh, two months ago and I think two weeks ago also in Prague. And I'm presenting this for you here. So. Uh, Linux uh, controls most of uh, x86 on your platform, but I say most, not everything. Between your Linux hardware, uh, between Linux, your, uh, your Linux kernel and your hardware, there are a lot of other things that uh, can actually intercept what you're doing and uh, change uh, what, uh, what you have actually instructed the, uh, the CPU to do. And unfortunately for you, uh, you wouldn't know that something was changed because this is how it's supposed to work. So uh, the problem for me is that you have something in your CPU that you don't control uh, that uh, runs uh, software like uh, outdated Java, uh, and I mean outdated like 10 years ago Java. Uh, with a lot of uh, security exploits. And here's the picture that 
uh, Ron and his friends uh, did. So you have this ring three, you know about this. Ring zero, you know about this too. Ring minus one, virtualization, you're fine with that. And at that point, we go to minus two, which you may think about it's part of uh, this infrastructure, or you may say, okay, it's only in the BIOS, and uh, uh, the BIOS after I boot, uh, we don't uh, reference it anymore. Unfortunately, the BIOS still runs on your machine, and it has its own operation, uh, operating system, and it actually runs. So it can uh, uh, hear stuff on your uh, PCI bus, uh, it can do stuff without you knowing. And you also have this uh, system management mode. And system management mode is actually another operating system in your CPU or BIOS, depending on uh, your vendor. So uh, system management mode is very strange. Uh, in it traps specific uh, uh, calls on the uh, PCI bus, and when the system management uh, call is made, actually everything else is stopped. The CPU cannot uh, handle any other inter uh, interrupts uh, or uh, handle any other instructions. It has to finish the system management uh, uh, mode call, and that's it. So this is a big issue for real-time systems, simply because real-time systems uh, really need deterministic uh, system. And when you can issue system management calls uh, to the PCI bus, actually uh, you can stop the CPU from working. Also, you have the uh, UFI uh, bootloaders, uh, or, uh, BIOS boot managers. I have a slide for that in a bit. And the other thing is, uh, kernel in ring minus three. What this is, is part of your CPU actually runs a Minix operating system. I think it was uh, uh, Minix three. Yes, Minix three. So uh, this Minix three is stripped down, very old, Minix three that runs Java inside of that, web servers in that, uh, inside of that, a lot of other services that are vulnerable inside of that CPU. And you cannot update this thing. You cannot uh, remove it easily. There is the uh, management, uh, management engine removal, but I'll talk about it uh, in a minute. So uh, you have this operating system in your CPU. Then you have the UFI. You have the uh, system management mode of your CPU that uh, has to be implemented this way. And then you have uh, uh, the BIOS on your system. So uh, what we have in this uh, is we have uh, IPv4. Sometimes we have IPv6. We have file systems. So these kernels actually can understand the file systems that you are working on. Uh, they have drivers for network cards, for USB, uh, for mouse. Why the hell you have drivers for that there? I don't know. Uh, sometimes they may have your passwords, uh, or sometimes you may find actually default passwords uh, on them. Uh, these devices can re-image your machine. Uh, a call to your built-in network card will definitely uh, re-image your machine, or at least crash it. Uh, but uh, they have the ability to download software from the, int uh, from the internet, mount your drives, reboot your machine, and install whatever they want there. And you cannot do anything about this at the moment. So uh, the management engine, uh, the thing, the Minix 3 in uh, your uh, CPU, it has full network management uh, support. Uh, it has drivers for one gigabit uh, uh, network cards. So we discussed this with Ron and a few of his uh, friends. If you have 10 gigabit network card, at least for, a moment, uh, for the moment, you're safe because they didn't have drivers for that uh, in Minix at that point. Uh, but if you connect uh, your internet cable to your built-in uh, one gigabit uh, card, mm, you are, f mm, yeah, you know. Uh, also, the same goes for if you uh, add a one gigabit card, which is the same model of the one gigabit card you have built in on your uh, on your motherboard. It's exactly the same situation because uh, this software runs in the CPU, so it controls all the PCI buses other PCI uh, lanes, so uh, it doesn't matter that it's a, a physical, uh, dif physically different LAN card. If it has drivers for it, it can control it. 
Uh, yeah. There are things. Uh, it was a good idea to have this in the CPU because you could actually re-image your machines when you are uh, large organizations with hundreds of uh, uh, workers in the organization. Sometimes, inevitably, inevitably uh, some of the machines will crash. You would want to reboot the machine. You would want to reinstall this without uh, driving like five kilometers to the next office. That was very nice. Unfortunately, uh, the solution they gave uh, is a bit problematic. Also, trying to remove this uh, will break your machine, probably. Uh, Linux may think that your CPU is secure, but uh, again, you don't know what's happening underneath there. Uh, there are like four flaws that, are, that have public exploits for this, uh, for the management engine. And uh, Intel patched, I think, 12 different bugs in a single uh, release uh, a few months ago. And uh, it was uh, called like, uh, we are doing a normal uh, fix of our uh, microcode here. Uh, I don't think this is normal. And uh, they neglected to tell you that this is a security problem. Uh, also, uh, most of the researchers that are currently debugging this, uh, reversing is uh, the right word here, are, they think that almost everything inside this Minix is exploitable. Uh, they used, uh, for the first uh, things that they uh, uh, published, they used exploits that were three or four years old. <laughs> so uh, it's a matter of, time, uh, matter of time simply to check all the exploits that we currently have against all the things that they know uh, they're running inside this man management engine. And uh, it would be very easy to uh, continue with this. Uh, the web server bug, yes, I told you about this. Uh, critical bug, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, the system management mode, very interesting. Uh, you cannot disable this. Uh, it's a mode that was uh, used also for programming the management engine. And so updating the management engine is something you do with the system management mode. The idea is uh, pretty simple. They don't want the other CPUs to work because their software is single-threaded. Uh, the software they wrote to manage uh, their CPUs is single-threaded, so they, they don't want other CPUs to compete for uh, the resources, and they disable all other CPUs, actually fully disable that. So uh, when you have a single uh, SMM call, you get a single core even if you have 80 on your machine. And it's pretty easy to exploit, actually. So you can downgrade the machine from 80 CPUs to a single CPU. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, you have another part of the system management mode, which is you have a term temperature control for your CPU, which is independent of your operating system. And it's part of this uh, system management mode. Uh, it reports via this interface that you have problems with the temperature of your, uh, of your CPU. Uh, System management interrupt, uh, this is the exploit I was talking about. You can simply write a software that will constantly issue system management interface uh, uh, calls and interrupts. And what will happen is uh, essentially you would have a very old machine. Uh, they managed to exploit this, the system management interface, simply to uh, remove parts of the management engine uh, in a very complicated but interesting uh, uh, attack for the CPU. Uh, UFI, okay. Uh, I really hate this. The first time I had a laptop or physical machine with uh, UFI, I disabled it. I ignored it for a few years. Then, uh, unfortunately, the new machines 
can have only UFI now. And UFI have uh, network boot support. It has uh, network uh, support for IPv6 and IPv4. Uh, it has a DHCP server in it. Uh, it has, uh, you can start a web server from it. You have a lot of other things. And uh, obviously, they have exploits for this. Uh, and uh, these are parts of mm, the UFI components that you can find on uh, your machines. And uh, removing UFI is a little bit uh, trickier because uh, some of these things are used for, for initializing parts of your CPU uh, memory. So you need uh, parts of UFI to actually trigger the other operating systems. So removing UFI would break also your machine. Uh, again, uh, I cannot continue with this because it, it's a talk for 40 minutes, but the idea was to show you how insecure your CPUs are. And I'm not talking only about Intel. Uh, AMD have uh, their own system. Uh, IBM have their own system. Uh, ARM have uh, their own systems inside their CPUs that are equivalent of Intel's. So uh, you're not safe with any other brand. Any questions? Uh, to the mic, please. What the fuck is this? This is the <laughs> first time I've ever heard of something like this. Um, why isn't it like more common knowledge or anything? This why is why I'm taking these 10 minutes to tell you about this. Well, take, take 10 days, come on, it's, it's awful. Ah, it's actually, it's not hidden. Uh, it's uh, somewhere in the 10,000 Intel pages for your CPU. If you buy the volumes, it's though. there. <laughs> Uh, you had a question? This was my question as well. Uh, so, what's the purpose of all these uh, under layers? What's the purpose of all these under layers? Uh, flexibility for uh, OEMs. Uh, so the manufacturers of your machines. Also flexibility for the sysadmins. Again, you need to reboot the machine. You don't want to go there. Like if, even if it is four, only four floors below you, you don't want to go from your uh, desk four floors down just to click the button to reboot the machine, right? Uh, Reimaging re your machines is also a very uh, important part. So flexibility was the main driver for this. And uh, the other thing was, uh, NSA and uh, the military, which uh, demanded this for their systems. Yeah, everything's on fire. What's the alternatives? What? What are the alternatives? What are the alternatives? There are no alternatives at the moment. You can, the only thing that you can do is try to brick your machine with uh, ME underscore uh, cleaner. Find it on GitHub. Please read the whole documentation before you do anything. And if you don't have a friend with programmer for your bias, don't do anything on your machine. Uh, Aron told me that uh, even though Google know about this, uh, they don't uh, remove uh, the management engine from their machines because it will definitely break their machines. Uh, unsuccessful uh, removing of the cleaner of the management engine can result in every 30 minutes reboot of your machine or not booting at all. So uh, if your machine is supported in the docs there in uh, GitHub, you can clean your machine. But there are like four or five types of machines that are supported at the moment. So you're a little bit, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'm continuing with the last thing. Uh, Nginx, Nginx, uh, I don't know uh, how it is pronounced correctly. So for me, it is Nginx, but it may be Nginx. Uh, it's very fast, uh, uh, one of the fastest web servers uh, out there. And uh, most of you are using uh, Nginx with uh, the package that you get from your distribution. So uh, what? Oops. Okay. Uh, so you get your distribution package, but uh, some of you may actually know that there are other packages uh, for Nginx, so they try to go to these repos to get uh, these other packages of uh, Nginx. 
There are other ways also. You can manually compile your engines and down, download all the uh, extensions that you want for uh, engines and that you have found on GitHub or anywhere else. Or you can go with uh, the paid subscription for Nginx Plus. But if you go for the paid uh, subscription, the problem is, again, uh, you're at their mercy. If they compile this for you, you can have it. If they don't, you don't have it. And that's it. What are the alternatives? Uh, you can have OpenRST or uh, Tengen. OpenRST is actually the same Nginx code that uh, you would get from uh, their side. However, uh, it is compiled with a lot of other features that I will talk about in a second. And the other is Tengen, that is, again, the vanilla Nginx, but with different features. Uh, these are completely different web servers, and there, there is a reason for that. So OpenRST was made uh, to be an application server. So it, you can use it as a front-end server. You can use it as a load balancer, as a normal engine. But uh, its main idea, uh, the design of the whole thing, was made to be uh, more flexible for uh, deploying uh, applications uh, written in Python, Ruby, PHP even, uh, simply to be faster for these type of uh, deployments. It also have uh, the Lua JIT inside of the engines compiled and uh, a lot of other Lua modules that uh, allow you to rate limit uh, requests and a lot of other stuff, like uh, pulling information from PostgreSQL or from Redis directly inside of engines. So instead of your application handling these uh, tasks, now the web server, which is engines, which is written very good, which we may not we may not be sure for our application that is so good, but we know that Nginx is very good. So we can use it and its performance to combine all of this data uh, in the web server. So uh, OpenRST, they uh, publish all of their modules on GitHub, so you can get different modules that you want from them and compile your own engines that you like. But it comes with 25 of their own modules, and uh, all of the engines modules compiled as uh, dynamic modules, so you can enable or disable them. You can find more information about OpenRST on their website and their GitHub. So uh, the main things that uh, we can get from OpenRST is the uh, SRegX. Uh, uh, this library is a simplified version of uh, uh, Perl, uh, P PCRA, uh, PCRA. <laughs> sorry, uh, the Perl regular expressions. Uh, the main idea here is that uh, they're not uh, so capable, you don't have uh, the full state machine that you have in uh, the Perl regular expressions, but they are a lot faster. And most of the times on uh, the web servers, you're not uh, using a regular expression that is uh, one or two screens long, right? Most of them are like one or two lines, max. The other is uh, the header, uh, headers more module. This is uh, very important when you want to add or edit he uh, headers on the fly. Uh, very, very nice. Uh, it's very nice to have it on your edge in front of, uh, after your application usually. Replace filter, if you want to replace parts of the body of the page, this cannot be done uh, without this module. Uh, I do believe that this uh, web server is the fastest web server for your uh, application platform, and uh, it would give you the more, uh, it's the, mo the most versatile. You can run anything on it. There is Tengen, and I really like Tengen here. We actually use Tengen on some of our servers, even though some of the sysadmins don't know it. Uh, this web server is uh, from Alibaba, and uh, Alibaba is a huge site. They have uh, thousands of machines, and uh, their web store uh, is probably the biggest in the world, bigger uh, than Amazon's. So uh, they, what they did was uh, they wanted a load balancer in front of their web application that would handle all of, your, all of their traffic. So they tailored this engine to be load balancer mainly. So they put all the modules that they need to be load balancer there and to do uh, what they want uh, in terms of performance. So uh, they have dynamic upstream. Uh, they have upstream domain uh, so you can 
have domains there and uh, change the uh, air records of these domains. Limit the upstream uh, tries, uh, check the upstream, keep alive. Uh, consistent hash and session sticky is something very important when you are load balancing. So if one client goes to uh, web server one and the second uh, client goes to web server two, you don't want web, uh, the second client to go to web, uh, web server one. You want the uh, second client to go to web server two. So uh, consistent uh, sessions is very important and consistent hash gives you uh, another functionality that keeps the client to a single uh, web server. Slice is a very strange module there, you can, you are allowed to actually slice your request, uh, request into multiple requests to multiple servers. So a big file can be actually spread into multiple servers by one, one load balancer. You can filter a lot of the things. Uh, uh, you uh, can again, uh, you use the headers module from OpenRST here, actually. Uh, you can change the uh, footer and the trim module is very interesting. You can ask Nginx, Tengine in this case, to simply remove all the white spaces and uh, uh, just make your HTML, CSS or JavaScript a little bit smaller by removing all the excess that you don't need, like uh, it uh, understands uh, white space and also uh, comments. So what you get out of there is uh, only pure code. Uh, you have additional module for uh, statistics. They have their own file system, so they have a uh, module for that. And they can uh, do stuff based on your uh, user agent. Uh, if you're preparing a proxy, use Tengine instead of Nginx. If you're preparing an application server, use OpenRST instead of uh, Nginx. They have newer versions of the software than your distributions, so better use that. Do I have que uh, time for one more question? Okay, so questions here? Nobody actually uses Nginx here, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.